Well, hello there. I'm Candy Palmiter at House of Anansi HQ in the Anansi Bookshop. I'll be speaking with Zalika Reed Benta and Christiane Conlon. Two amazing books, both collections of short stories. Do you have that connection to the character when you're writing it that I have reading it? Are you sad when a story is done and your connection to that character is done? Yes and no. I mean, if I'm writing a short story, I feel like that moment in their life is what needs to be shown. But my experience of reading um, Zalika's book, when I read the first story, I'm like, oh, I'm so sad to say goodbye to her. And then there she was <laughs> in the know. next story, right? And the next and the next. And it, But it really had that feel of a novel, which is I'm really in admiration of that because it also they feel like discrete stories that mm. come together. Kara and those characters stayed in my mind a lot. Um, like I went to bed with them, I woke up with them. When it became a story, it wasn't that like, when I ended the story, I felt sad. It's more like, did I do these characters justice? When I was reading your book, I made a bit of a faux pas. I pictured it being you. And then it dawned on me, wait, this is fiction. I'm still struggling with how to, to take that. What is it about um, writers of color and black writers and indigenous writers and um, you know women and female writers that they just, people automatically assume that it's you, do we not? have claim to fiction like white writers and white male writers do. That sense, like Kara is a very introspective character. She's a very quiet character. And I did that purposely because as a child, I remember reading a lot of books and even as a young adult where characters were, were you know, extroverted and where they were like, you know, sassy or whatever. And I was like, I don't really relate to that kind of experience. I just yeah. wanted to write something that you know, second generation diasporic, specifically Caribbean, specifically black women, or people could relate to because I just never saw that. When I was growing up, I was a big reader. My first book written by an Aboriginal person, I was 25. As a kid, I just assumed Indigenous people don't write, so that wouldn't be something that would be open to me. What I wondered about with both of you, because both of you have very distinct communities that you're coming from and that, and that you're writing about, what kind of pushback do you get I would say the pushback that I got is people will say how, well, you're just showing the dark side. Mm. Growing up in rural Nova Scotia, we, we weren't as poor as some people, but we didn't have very much. Mm. And I didn't find myself in the literature that I grew up reading. Right. So I wanted to write about that experience in, on the East Coast of growing up as uh, w with such tradition and expectation. Um, and oppression, and it's so hard to leave, and yet it's so hard to stay away. It's interesting because it's so romanticized as this place of, of fishing and beautiful land. But if you look at the, the history, right, it's one of the first settled areas, mm -hmm. what was done to the Mi'kmaq, um, to African Nova Scotians, and the uh, the Acadians were deported, and I think it's where I find the most, um, where at times I feel the saddest and the most optimistic by the people who, who challenge that. Yes. What's fiction without friction as well? Yeah, right? yeah, it's exactly. Like so that's what I get at times. People get hostile and defensive. The one thing, and I knew, I always knew I was going to get pushback about that, was the way that I wrote Patwa. Uh, because it's an oral language. So so even right now, there's, um, because, you know, there's this whole thing in Jamaica about making it the official language of Jamaica, but nobody really knows how to write it because we haven't written it. Before my book went to print, a, a Jamaican man had read it, and he had, like, different corrections for, for certain things. Um, for instance, um, there's gua. Um, which can be like Wagwan or Wagwan here or something like that. But he was like, well, we wouldn't say Guan for that. We say Gween. And then when um, someone else had read it, she was like, okay, but we wouldn't say Gween. We would say Guan for this and we would say that. And I was just kind of like, yeah, because there's no particular way to spell it right now. What about people who are not from your communities writing about your communities? I just never understood why people from outside of my community or outside of other communities would want to write about that community. And I think especially if it's marginalized communities or communities of color or communities that aren't in the mainstream 
Um, it's not because there aren't people from that community who aren't writing it. It's because of lack of access. Then instead of writing it when you're not from that community, you can never understand it the way that that person from a community can understand it, then find a way to support someone who is actually from that community. One of the things I've found, and I think it's, it's, it's a whole systemic issue with the world that we're living in, and certainly in North America and capitalism is, and patriarchy, is that the idea of helping is they'll lead the way, right? It's yeah. not making space. It's like an inability to see that you don't need to lead the way. You just need to step aside. You need to get out of the way. Yeah. When everybody was freaking out about um, the Black Little Mermaid, I was just kind of like, so? And they're like, well, aren't you having, like, we have our own stories. We have Mommy Watson. We have our own mermaids. Why do we need to, to make Ariel black? That doesn't really do anything for me, especially coming off of something like Black Panther, where it was just like, you know, essentially the entire cast was black. The director was black. The writers were black. The Ooh. makeup artists were black. The, everybody was black. Having one black person in a Disney movie doesn't really do anything for me. And so it was, that's probably the latest thing where I've done where I was trying to explain mm. how race bending, as they say, a certain like character doesn't mean anything to me because that doesn't affect any real change. It's basically virtue signaling. So I was yes. just like, okay, so until it permeates every aspect of this production, then that doesn't really mean anything to me. I had the same experience with Pocahontas, of oh. course. <laughs>